Good evening, everybody. This is Patrick uh, Milliken from the Poison Food Bookstore. And I'm here with three old friends uh, to celebrate the publication of this really remarkable new anthology uh, called Speculative Los Angeles. And uh, with me is Denise Hamilton, uh, who edited the book um, and wrote a story, uh, Dwayne Swarzynski and Ben Winters. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to have you all here. Great to be here. Great to be here. The old form, the formal intro, which I'm going to steal from uh, the back of the book, and I may embellish a little bit. Um, uh, so Denise, uh, Edgar Award uh, finalist Denise Hamilton is the author of seven crime novels and the editor of the best-selling anthology Los Angeles Noir, which includes the Edgar Award winning short story The Golden Gopher by Susan Strait and Los Angeles Noir II, the classics. She's a former Los Angeles Times journalist, a Fulbright scholar, a noir and sci-fi fantasy geek, and a proud LA native who refuses to speak only in English. I like that. Um, and very, you'll be very excited to hear, I'm gonna ask her about this work in progress that I've heard about, a little rumor about. So excited to hear about a new novel. Um, and uh, let's see here. Dwayne Swarzynski is the two-time Edgar Award nominated author of 10 novels, including Revolver, Canary, and the Seamus Award-winning Charlie Hardy series, many of which are in development for film and TV. Uh, Swarzynski has also written over 250 comic books featuring The Punisher, Deadpool, Judge Dredd, and Godzilla, among other notable literary figures, a native Philadelphian who now lives in LA with his family. And uh, I also wanna say, uh, I think I first became aware of Dwayne's work with uh, the book, The Wheel Man, which is an absolute noir, hard-boiled classic. Uh, as you know, as are so many of your books. Um, I've well, been following your stuff from the very beginning. Uh, and Ben Winters, my friend, is the New York Times bestselling author of Underground Airlines, Golden State, and The Last Policeman Trilogy. He has won the Edgar Award, the Philip K. Dick Award, and France's, I'm going to blow this, Grand Prix La Imaginaire. Sorry, I'm such a great. Uh, Winters has also written books for young readers, numerous plays and musicals and articles about books and culture for Slate, the New York Times, uh, among others. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife and three kids. And he has a new book coming out this year called The Quiet Boy. Very excited to hear a little bit more about that. But um, just to kind of kick this, kick oh. this off. Yeah, she's got the book. <laughs> Bless your heart. Thanks, and uh, just to kind awesome. of kick off the discussion, uh, I, was, I was talking before we got started here about about just the whole, the whole philosophy behind this series that's being launched. Um, Denise, you were very early on in the Akashic's Noir series. I think El Los Angeles Noir was fairly early on in the run, wasn't it? 2008, I don't know when Brooklyn Noir came out, but um, somewhat early. Fairly early on, right. Yeah. And of course, you know, Johnny, Johnny has blanketed the globe with his noir anthologies, and uh, they're, they're such wonderful, you know, such wonderful books. Um, and tell us a little bit about about the idea behind speculative Los Angeles and what what the term speculative really means. Well, um, after doing speculative, I mean, um, <laughs> L.A. Noir to the classics, I was thinking, okay, what else? because I just felt like there was something missing, you know, not necessarily in the noir canon, but I just thought LA is such a strange, bizarre place. What else could we do? And dark fantasy, sci-fi, um, you know, shapeshifter novels uh, have always interested me. And so I, I kind of thought, okay, let's do like dark fantasy sci-fi LA. And Akashic liked the idea a lot. So they're like, yeah, let's do it. And let's do it in the same format as the LA Noirs because that worked really well. And if you're not familiar with those, uh, it's like about 12 to 15 different stories by different authors. And each author picks a different neighborhood, a specific neighborhood to set the story in. And the authors are usually from that city. So they're very familiar with the city. They've lived there. They know the ins and outs. And part of the, the joy and excitement of the stories is that each one has kind of a local color and you feel like you're in the hands of someone who actually lives there and knows the turf and didn't just parachute in to write the story. So um, 
I was like, yeah, let's do that. And so we kind of batted around the idea of, okay, what's the umbrella title going to be? Is it going to be Weird LA? Is it going to be Fantasy and Sci-Fi LA? And, you know, it's such a broad, inclusive term. And so we, we tried to find the, the broadest title, which is speculative, which, you know, can include zombies and werewolves and, you know, urban myths and, um, you know, demons and anything else you can think of. It's interesting because, you know, LA, you know, again, we were talking before we got started. It is such a unique place in so many ways. And I've always thought of LA, you know, it's one of those cities where the ghosts of the past are never really far from you, you know, no matter where you go. You know, there's the Hakaranda trees and, you know, um, just the ghosts are coming up through the sidewalk, it seems like, everywhere you turn. And it, it also has this really interesting occult underbelly to it. Um, you know, I've, I've always found that interesting. And some of the stories yeah. really go into that, you know, especially yours, Dwayne. Uh, sort of, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> By default. <laughs> yeah. Although, although I think Stephen Blackmore's story takes the, takes the prize as far as like great you know, classic <laughs> occult LA is like, I mean, some of these things I, I've read, read about LA history is like shocking, like, wow, they did that here. No wonder the place is down, you know, of course, <laughs> that makes sense. Right. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to do the Phoenix Noir book. I edited that book. And uh, I remember Johnny's, you know, kind of directive at the very beginning, which was kind of what you said, you know, I want each book to be set in a distinct locale. And I also want it to be a vaguely ac accurate ethnic representation of the city. That was really important. Um, you know, that it not be just a bunch of white dudes, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you assembled, I mean, because LA is such a huge city, uh, you know, and, and kind of narrowing it down to, you know, 15 stories or 12 stories. How did you go about that? Did you say, hey, I want an East LA story and then approach the author? Can you talk a little bit about that? No, I, I, I didn't. It was actually really cool uh, how everybody just kind of scattered into their own hood or, or locale that they wanted. And in fact, uh, Dwayne came on about, you know, halfway through and he said, well, someone's probably picked Hollywood already because that's an obvious one. I go, no, no one's picked Hollywood. It's all yours. <laughs> so I was, um, shocked. I was shocked. Like, really? <laughs> well, because you know what? We also, I think that these, you know, LA authors know that um, there have been so many stories written about Hollywood that unless you have some really fresh take, which both you guys did, um, and actually yours is more like, um, Ben, yours is more like Culver City, but, um, you know, like Alex Espinosa said, oh, I want to write about El Sereno, which is like this hot new Latino neighborhood east of uh, downtown, and so there wasn't like a big fight to, uh, to write about Hollywood, um, not at all. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's a really nice sampling of, I think the, the collection kind of reflects the, the, the cultural makeup of Los Angeles too. We have a, a broad range, everything from like urban, urban myth to, you know, straight on demons and ghosts and um, alternate, alternate histories. Right. And what's so interesting is LA and, um, you know, Hollywood uh, cast such a long shadow on Los Angeles. It's already... Uh, you know, half speculative, like, you know, you hear gunshots, then you don't know if they're real gunshots or they're filming down the street. Right, you, know? right. or you see people dressed up as cowboys and you don't, are they real cowboys or are they actors on break? You know, so you can, as, yeah. as writers, we can all play around with that a little bit, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah well, the, the industry, the, in, the company town is about the creation of alternate realities, which makes it a really fun, weird, special place to live you know and like although having said that part of what i like about the anthology is that before i moved here i think the entertainment business and hollywood the sort of hollywood part of la loomed very large you know in, in my imagination of what the city was all about and it's been really delightful to live here and discover all these different neighborhoods and all these different industries and um people who have just no connection to this insane business you know it's like hollywood hollywood is such a small part in fact, of the city's cultural life, it's it's really um, people don't really I think necessarily understand that. In the same way that you go to New York City, and be like, well, it's all about Times Square or whatever. It's like, well, yeah, that's like a tiny sliver. But for people who actually live there, you wouldn't even want to go there. You know, it isn't even like part of your. <laughs> 
So true. The other thing is you can dip in and out of different realities. Like one day you can be a vampire and then the next day you can be a fairy. And then, you know, the next day you can be an alien. And there are people who live their lives that way, you know, yeah. in these alternate realities. So it's not only the constructed reality, but it's the individual realities that, that people um, yeah. put on and take off. You know, on that note too, I mean, I, one thing that always strikes me about LA is that it really is 88 or more different worlds stitched together. I mean, you drive from one neighborhood to the next, it's so different. Like it's radically different. So it's almost like touring, you know, an entire country, you know, with a matter of minutes. Um, like San Gabriel Valley, driving through like, you know, Pasadena is very different from Sierra Madre, different from Arcadia. So you just kind of go, wow, how did these things happen? And how are we all together? What happened? Was there a nuclear accident that melted us all together <laughs> at some point? <laughs> what, what happened? It's, it's kind of fascinating. But Ben's right. It, it is, before coming here too, I thought, oh, it's all about, it's Hollywood, it's movies, it's the business, but that's such a small part of, you know, city life here that it's kind of, it's great and refreshing. I kind of uh, love LA more for that fact that it is you know, all of these different people trying to make it all work. And it's kind of fascinating. Well, it has that wonderful history of boom and bust too. Yeah. And, um, I think a great, kind of a great uh, metaphor uh, is as Wyatt Earp, you know, um, you know, somebody who kind of lived through the very end of the frontier era and then spent his waning days in Hollywood, you know, writing for the movies and yeah. actively involved in creating the mythology that he just lived through, you know, I and mean, it's fascinating stuff. I love it. That's pretty cool. It's a good example, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, both of you guys wrote pretty hard boiled stories. I mean, I know that all three of us happen to be, you know, uh, crime writers too. And right. um, there's, you know, there's there's some crazy stuff in, in yours, ah. Dwayne. Um, you, I really got like the pop horror sci-fi kind of element in 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 your story um what made you decide to to, to go that route what was funny is i remember i looked it up today because i was curious where i had an, an idea journal where i kind of keep track of where ideas come from and i traced it back to like early and not too long after we met for coffee to discuss the idea um our former president said something dumb which is like every day but this is like especially dumb and i was so angry i'm like god what if all of us just concentrate really hard maybe his head will explode that'd be awesome you know right I just thought, ooh, wait, that's a cool, that's, 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 maybe it's a novel. So I, it's funny, I mean, my note said it was like, I was thinking about calling it democracy, you know, or a horror story or rule of the people, you know, that kind of idea that, okay, if we all get together and really exercise our, our, our will, heads will roll. Then I thought, okay, but in terms of LA, you know, what also strikes me here is that everyone has a YouTube channel. Everyone has, you know, their social media platform. Everyone's famous, essentially, everyone's famous. What if you don't want to be famous? What if, if you are being, fa I think famous means you are a target for anonymous people who could kill you and like make your head explode. So that's kind of where it started. I think a lot of like reaction to the current events, but also LA itself, you know, it really is, you, meet, you can't not meet someone who doesn't have some kind of platform, <laughs> it seems like, even though it's a real town, but everyone, that's kind of our reality. So I think you find to turn it on its head and see what happens if no one wanted to be famous. You know, there's something very Max Headroom when, 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 I, when I read your story, it was like, there was something very like, I don't know, I don't know if Max, well, he's pop, he's schlock, he's, he's right. you know, cyberpunk or whatever, but there was something very, um, you could tell that you have absorbed a lot of uh, like horror and like that, those 50s sci-fi crazy movies and, and all of that. And, you know, I, I love how you brought all that to bear on the story. I spent way too much time at the New Beverly when it was open to the cinema, the movie theater, and they show a lot of just great, you know, weird, weird movies. And the idea of like, you know, a movie watching fascinates me. I was always usually a watch at home kind of guy, but here it's places to go the Egyptian, you know, all over the New Beverly, I mentioned the arrow. And it's like, basically you're in a room with strangers and you're dreaming collectively. It's great. You know, I love going even by myself because I don't have to talk to anybody. I can just sort of collectively dream with these just strangers. And that act itself was like kind of, to me, uh, kind of fascinating. Like, why do we do that? You know, why is that good? What do we get, get, what do we get from that? So that's, I guess, as a you know, pop element to it is trying to capture like why we watch movies, you know, or why we all gather in, in strange rituals you know, to watch really bizarre movies at three in the morning, which I've done. Let's talk so, about why do we care about these 
the celebrities, the movie stars themselves. I found it really interesting in your story. Just the idea of like, yeah. it's beyond just like, I like this story. And it's sort of like, why do I give a shit about this <laughs> famous person? Like, why do you become obsessed? And like, Hollywood's been about that from the beginning too. That like, you know, the movie studios and like, that was very consciously like, we're going to create stars and then people are going to pay money to see these individuals. And then we're going to care about their private lives. And right. then like, then suddenly you had these scandals you know, like I was just reading about Fatty Arbuckle, like, and there's these oh, yeah. crazy stories of like these people were. It was the idea of celebrity was new in this way of like someone yeah. would see the character and you would fall in love with them, and then they would do something reprehensible in their private life, and it would be this. this there was this whole mechanism of the studios trying to cover it up. It's like all of that stuff, and we're still obviously all that is accelerating, accelerating. I think that's part of what is so cool about your stories, like. It's like, what if that just keeps accelerating? The obsession with celebrity <laughs> and like the celebrities trying to not be known anymore. I don't know. I loved it for that reason. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Concentrating so hard, they make someone's head explode. It's great. It's like Abby <laughs> Hoffman to like the end, you know, because like the whole deal about they're going to concentrate so much, they levitate the Pentagon. It's right, like that. exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It has uh, it has the nexus of uh, Musso and Franks too. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't resist. I mean, the whole corridor is like between, you know, Highland and Kapanga. I just, all that stuff fascinates me. You know, there's the Egyptian theater, there's Musso and Frank, which I, you know, one of my very first times there, I was taken by um, a fellow writer, Terrell Langford. It was almost like your initiation. Oh, you come to LA, have a martini at Musso's. That's your, like, you're welcome. You know, here's your, here's your speeding ticket. You know, it was kind of cool. So that place still lives large in my imagination. And I kind of, it's been a year now, obviously, since we've been anywhere, but I miss those places so much. And I'm an introvert. I hate being outside. So that's it. Says a lot that I'm missing. You know, all these places. You just miss the martinis, bro. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to miss. No one's sitting at home making themselves a martini. Maybe somebody is. It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> it's well, really easy, but it's in a way. I think that taking those worlds and their many multi-layered worlds with many metaphors for both of you. And moving it into speculative fiction somehow frees you completely up because you can make anything happen. You can do the craziest things that you couldn't do in real life. And, you know, um, actions have consequences, right? That, you know, oh, you wanted that celebrity so bad. Now we're going to, we're going to blow you up. And, um, <laughs> you know, your, your, char your character, Ben, um, you know, you seem, I, yeah. we've never met in real life, although I hope we can rectify that once everyone's um, vaccinated yeah. uh, and have a drink at Musso and Frank's or somewhere, but you seem like such a nice guy, but <laughs> what a villain, you know, you created. <laughs> he's not a villain, he just, he's a TV producer, so it's a fun <laughs> uh, One might say the two were synonymous, I don't know. Uh, apologies. The character I was going for is a guy who he creates a show that is features teen suicides in a somewhat glamorous way, right? But, and so then he's haunted by the kind, he's literally haunted by the consequences. That's the setup of the story. But what I, I guess the thing is, and it's a little, my story is called Peak TV. If you haven't read it, it's about the television. I know you've read it. It's about the television business. And like he, the thing is that and this happens all the time. It wasn't his idea, right? He's like a mid-level guy. He's got an overall deal which just means that the studio is paying you to, to, to work for them until such time as you earn out, as you develop something, whatever. So if someone brings him this idea and he's like, oh yeah, great, I'll do this. And so it isn't like he set out to glamorize teen suicide. His career just went that way and he went with it. So I thought that was, I don't know. I like the idea <laughs> of someone passively doing something fairly evil. It felt to me resonant with my limited experience with the television business is that it's very easy for things to just sort of accrete and snowball and suddenly you're involved with something like it wasn't your idea you don't, you don't, you don't have total control over it because there's this huge corporate conglomerate that is like calling shots i don't know it's, it's a fascinating murk of a business in the way that it operates but this guy ultimately is responsible for this thing that causes real live damage in the world because kids are watching the show and they the they're killing themselves, you know, because it's glamorized in the show and it's sexy and it's so it's sad. And um, anyway, and then he's haunted by this murderous ghost. Because I agree, Denise. Like, I think he's a pretty great villain. I was like, well, I hate this guy, you know. I was like, what douche. <laughs> but I felt yeah. like you you painted him so well in in a few yeah. pages. You really crawled inside this guy's really? head, and even his swearing and his, you know, I, I just felt like I knew this guy. Yeah. You know, even though I, I don't. You. 
I'm embarrassed because I never really thought of him as a villain. I mean, I don't, he's totally a villain. Like, he does something terrible and he, and he pays the price for it. But like, he loves his kid. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, no, he, he, does. Does. he does. And he, it's this, I don't know, to me, the story is about, is about, like you said, Denise, it's about consequences, right? It's about hmm. we as artists should and do generally feel free to create as we see fit, right? And those of us who are just publishing books, I mean, come on, who reads books anymore? Like, I feel like, but in TV, you know, these shows have a huge cultural reach. And I think it's interesting. It was interesting for me to contemplate that on the one hand, it's very easy to be like, I'm an artist, I should be able to do whatever I want. I have this idea, I should go with it. On the other hand, like you have to at a certain point be like, I'm actually affecting the world. And like, if I, for example, make a TV show that's all white characters, well, people are gonna watch that and have like, and it's gonna shape the way people think about the world. And like, so I don't know, I think culture and TV and film are constantly grappling with the extent and how they interact with reality and how they don't. So this was just a kind of parable of that with a monster. Well, I loved it and it made me laugh so much. And I was Thank I you. was just so delighted when he got his comeuppance because- <laughs> Thank you. And so, like, so many great details about like, I, I mean, the scene where like uh, he discusses writers pitching him, you know, their ideas and the nervousness, this sort of like, I'm like, man, I feel seen. Oh, ouch, that's, you know, <laughs> oh, I've been there. I mean, <laughs> you and me both, we've been in those, I mean, I've been in those, I'm always on the other side. I'm always, the, I'm the nervous, sweaty wreck trying to get some exec to, to, to like totally. all my eye. And I'm sure well you've done, experienced man. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of respect exactly. for you as a novelist. There was like, oh, wow. A novelist you're a serious writer like yeah. but then that gets you like 30 seconds and as soon as you start yes. telling your idea like mm, mm, exactly mm. right <laughs> no it's just the whole world was, i mean like, like Denise said it, it evokes so much in such a few pages like hey how do you do this it's like all these great i love i love hollywood novels like they have locust on so i kind of yeah. thought, man, he, he just nailed it he nailed this the la i know yeah. in these rooms like in like two pages read, so um, recently, well done you read Big shorty the elmore leonard i mean oh yeah I, yeah I read it recently. I probably read it right before I wrote this, Brandon, because I think that is like the the ultimate of the sort Wait, of. Uh, what, what's the name? What? What's the name? Which 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 of his? Oh, get, get shorty. shorty. Okay. Yeah. 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 And like the, yeah. the movie is great, but the book is like, he just works. He's so swift, and it just it just cuts like a knife. And if you spent any time here, and because I think it's eternal. Like that book was set like thirty years ago now or whatever. But like, yeah, it's eternal. The re the relationship between writers and directors and actors and the the, the kind of the the. The lingo, it's one word for it. You could also just call it BS, but just the way people talk, <laughs> it's like, I don't know, it's it's a wonderful totally. book. But I think that because it's been done so much and we've also seen it on screen, it's really hard to come at it from a fresh perspective. And I think both you guys did that. And that's why I loved your stories so much because it was like, okay, we have not seen this. It is, it is you know, these are... Hollywood well, tales. But... Dwayne does, he does with a magic touch. I was just, I just emailed Dwayne a couple <laughs> weeks ago because I finally read or listened to actually Revolver. And if you haven't read Dwayne's most, is that your most recent novel? It is, yes. Fucking, sorry, it's so good. Oh, it's so thank you, good. Man. And <laughs> thank you. That, that thing where I just wrote a book, Oh, The Quiet Boy, which Denise held up before sweetly, which comes out, comes out May 18th. You can find nice. it in Poison Pen. But, uh, <laughs> um, the, it jumps in time, right? It does the thing where it's going back and forth between changing time periods. And you know, whenever you do something like that, you're like, I'm a genius, I'm the best. I can't believe I did this, it's so clever. <laughs> and then I read Dwayne's book, I was like, oh, he's got three time periods he's jumping in between. I'm like, damn it. It's like, oh, I learned to ride a unicycle and this guy's like juggling on his unicycle. I don't recommend it, man. I, I was I was a hard book to write. <laughs> I remember when I bought BoucherCon and actually Long Beach, I was in 2014, I was here, I guess. And I literally had brought my index cards from home my hotel room wall i mapped it out like, I, I gotta get a hand on this thing it was like so much of a mind melt after a while but i'm glad it worked i'm just glad it worked at all let alone you know it worked, worked it's better than you know High <laughs> recommend. I had a poison oh thank you man it's so funny because that. uh I, I wanted to ask denise a little bit about her story of course yes it's set up in encino and uh you, know, you talked about how these different air parts of la have completely different vibes and feels and I, I think that's absolutely true in this case. And you really see that. Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, um, yeah, it's it's that kind of uh, in Encino, but uh, that's the valley. But it's also, it's, uh, it's set in a bar that I want to exist really badly. If you know the Santa Monica Mountains and the trails up there, it's so beautiful and there's all the, you know, I go, I like to do trail running. So I run all through the, the Santa Monica's 
And I just thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a bar that had been there forever and was really hard to get to, like you couldn't drive to, you had to hike to it. And it was kind of built into the, the mountain and it was kind of this secret thing. And, you know, it had been there since time immemorial, which meant there were people from time immemorial who, who were there. And I always think about the history of this place and how when I, you know, I grew up here, when I was in fourth grade and we did California history, we learned about the the wonderful Spanish missions and the Padres, the benevolent Padres and how they they took care of the Indians, you know, the, they didn't even have names, they were just the Indians. Um, and, and then you find out later, oh, actually they enslaved the Indians and oh, actually there was genocide and oh, and the Spanish soldiers raped all the, the women and killed them and the men and, uh, you know, it's a bloody genocide. It's the story of America, but we really don't learn that, that history. And um, it's to the point where like, if you like the, the, the Native Americans from the area around Mission San Gabriel or Mission San Francisco, for a long time, they, they weren't even known by their own names. They were known as the Gabrieleños or the, um, the uh, Fernandeños. And I just thought that was just so hauntingly awful that even their identity had been stripped from them, you know. Um, so anyway, I just was always thinking about that and um, Me Too was happening and I just kind of put it all together and it's set, you know, the day after Halloween, Dia de los Muertos and uh, weird stuff is happening in that bar. You guys know much about, I mean, LA is so packed with interesting stuff, but do you know, know much about the whole Chavez Ravine story? Yes. yes. I found that really interesting and sort of telling, getting into the same, some of the same subject matter that you're talking about. Do you guys yeah. know all about that? How the. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. The, I got that wonderful book of photographs the guy took in Chavez Ravine. And Greg Newmark, I think his name was. Oh. Right. Yeah, and it's a yeah, it's a book of photos, and uh, he took them in like the 30s and 40s and 50s, I think, before the communities were destroyed. And yes, that's another haunting. It's around where uh, Dodger Stadium is today, and the people who lived there, they they were like, um, you know, kind of these un these enclaves, um, little bungalows and things that, that were mainly Latino. There were three different communities there, and they. City basically came in through eminent domain and took all the land and basically said, oh, we're going to build better houses for you or we're going to put you in these nice high rises with, uh, you know, running water and electricity and everything. And then they just screwed these people. And some of them, they literally, the sheriffs had to come and yeah. drag them out because they didn't want to leave. But it was like the city wanted to build Dodger Stadium. So every time I go there and every time I run around there and, you know, see a Dodger game, I, those those places haunt me and, yeah. and hi history, the hidden history. Well, right, right. Cooter has that, you know, that thematic album, you know, about Chavez Ravine. And it's, oh, yeah. I'm, I know, I'm sorry to take us off topic here, but it's just one of those endless LA stories that uh, is very telling. Yeah. Um, and this, your, the, your story is great. I mean, as far as it, it, it's the whole entire world you evoke, you kind of, you were one of the few kind of backward looking like where do we come from Who, whose land was this i kind of thought because at first like oh, this is a cool like mysterious hike to the woods story i'm like oh wait this is huge <laughs> it's really it was just it kind of it, it, it expanded beautifully it was like wow okay it's like a neil gaiman kind of thing where it was like you know these sort of you know, caught characters out of time out of space and they're kind of you know our secret past you know it, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm clubbing this but it's, it's wonderful it was really great oh, i kind of wish for a longer book you know <laughs> using that same that same world What can you give us kind of, um, you know, it's funny with short stories, you don't want to say too much because you don't want to spoil them. But um, there, there are some really wonderful surprises in this book and, and the, the approaches that all the different writers took were, uh, were it, it's a great, it's funny when, when you were assembling the book, you know, um, did you create, it's almost like creating the ultimate mixtape in a way. You're guiding somebody through an experience through these different pieces. And it's important to get them the order right, you know. Um, did you? Was that a challenge? Was that was that fun? Challenge, and it was <laughs> fun. Questions. And 
I love your analogy about the mixtape because of course, young people won't know what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. With a mixtape, because that dates us. Oh, but, sure. right. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, um, yes, because you're, I mean, curate is such an overused word. I don't want to use that word. I like the idea of putting together a mixtape, but it's a mixtape about LA weirdness and alternate realities and alternate history and demons and social, you know, d dystopia. And, and I was so glad that it kind of shook out that way because I didn't know what people were going to turn in before they turned them in. And, um, you know, so you get, you get a story about these giant, like mecha, you know, uh, monsters, um, you know, these robots battling it out on a landfill in La Puente. <laughs> And that's only yeah. part of the story, you know, and love who, story, mostly. That was great. Mm -hmm. story. Yeah, it's a love, love story. story. Yeah. yeah. And I, there was nobody else who was going to write about that because that that was just a wonderful, wonderful story. And so I was really happy when the stories came in because everybody kind of put their own spin on things. And um, and I know I've mentioned Alex Espinosa before. He doesn't really, uh, this is his first speculative fiction, really. But he was so angry about ICE and the uh, um, separation of families that he just was, I think he wrote it in a, in a frenzy, you know, and it just, it just poured out of him. And it was so haunting. It's a, it's a changeling story about a 21st century changeling and a kid who comes back from being separated from his mom in ICE custody. And he's a toddler. He barely speaks. You know, he's, he's so little. And the mom says, this is not my child. It looks like mm. her child. It's, you know, all the ideas correct, but a mom knows, right? Or does she? That is this her child or not? So I love the way some people just like, you know, tore the stories out of the headlines. And then again, the whole thing about writing speculative fiction is you can do anything you want. You can go into 25 dimensions, you know, move backward and forward in time and play 12 dimensional chess or whatever you want to do. So, um, so yeah, I was really lucky because everyone was just so professional. Everyone turned their stories in on time. And, um, and then it was just That's a matter great. of assembling the puzzle pieces, you know, what's going to fit where. It was fun. That's the, most, that's the most crazy thing I've heard from this whole anthology that everybody turned their stories in on time. I find that <laughs> the most alternate reality piece of the whole thing. That's true. That never happens. Guys are all professionals. That's, that's why I picked you. <laughs> well, and it was great to see, you know, uh, a story from Luis Rodriguez, you know, because um, that that always running, you know, what a classic, you know, modern, modern classic. Um, and you, you know, Amy Bender, who else is in the book? You have some great pieces. Yeah, you know, Lu Luis Rodriguez, you know, when I knew he was going to write uh, future dystopia because uh, it's already here, you know, and what was really interesting was that um, these stories were being written during the Me Too movement, during Black Lives Matter, during the Trump administration, it was a very grim, violent, depressing time where you did feel you were already in a dystopia, kind of. And um, so I, I, I'm not surprised that Luis Rodriguez, who's, you know, kind of an activist and you know, he's has the he's been around since the, the 60s and seen so many things happen in L.A., his hometown. So it was so wonderful to have this band of rebels in the Angeles National Forest uh, fighting against a fascist corporate state that had taken over L.A. after uh, the big one hit. So he, he got every dystopia in. The only thing he didn't get in was a tsunami. <laughs> And I like in, in your story, Denise, I liked how you, you referenced uh, Los Lobos, who are, you know, the quintessential Los Angeles band, really, in my opinion, you know, that whole East LA. And, you know, I think uh, uh, David Hidalgo is just a national treasure, you know. Um, the, whole, the whole band is, and they, they haven't um, gone Hollywood, you know, they, they're very down home and I've, uh, I've talked to them and I've hung out with them. Uh, 
in other places, you know, where they were playing and um, they're, they're just, they're just wonderful. And um, yeah, they should be even better known than they are. I think they are pretty well known, but um, that I song just seemed perfect for the, yeah. for the, you know, I was thinking Absolutely. we should do a soundtrack. Everybody yeah. should like come up with a song oh, for yeah. their story. And we should oh, yeah. like do a little mixtape. That's, that's a cool. fun part of these anthologies is putting together something like that. We did one for the highway kind and that was, that was a blast. <laughs> I actually used uh, I actually yeah. used the Whittier Boulevard by the Midnighters, which is a great, you know, East LA car culture kind of, kind yeah. of. So that was a blast. Um, so Ben, for, you, for your story, Ben, we, uh, who let the dogs out? What's what's the what would you go for? What's your song? Or, <laughs> or float on, or I'm not sure. What, what, the... No, that's good. I'll take it. There's all, yeah, there's the uh, yeah. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit just about about LA uh, right now um, because it really is going through a fascinating and I'm. I'm speaking from Phoenix here, so I'm at a remove, but I, I try to follow what's going on. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a shape-shifting town. And right now it's kind of in the process of putting on a new, a new skin, it seems. Yeah. Uh, last time I was out there was pre-pandemic, but, uh, you know, it was great to see all these wonderful old Art Deco theaters, you know, in downtown that were, you know, probably Spanish language church fronts for the last 40 years. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the La Fonda Theater being brought back to its glory, you know, all these different old things happening, uh, and lots of new. I don't know. I don't really have a question. Just uh, <laughs> questions about LA and what it's, what's happening right now in the city. Jeez, I mean, right now it's Big weird because everything <laughs> shut down. You know, and there's I think there's a weirdness when, in terms of movies in particular, like what's going to happen. I think there's a big question about what happens uh, to, to to live not live, but rather to, you know, to, to feature films and all of these movie theaters, um, because I think there's a lot of pressure uh, on the theater chains from the studios that they don't want to give them the theatrical window anymore. They want to release everything directly, which mm -hmm. is going to change the culture of movie going, which in turn is going to change a lot about LA. So I think that in terms of my like tiny little um, view on how the entertainment business is changing, I think it's a pretty interesting thing that's happening right now. During the pandemic, uh, I think, I think it was, Warner Brothers was the first one to be like, we're going to stop yeah. you know, releasing direct, you know, let, letting theaters show things. We're going to let things go directly to HBO Max and the, and the theater chains were aghast, you know, because um, that's, but on the other hand, that's, people's lives are changing, you know, and even before the pandemic, people were more inclined to stay home. So I, I just think it's an interesting thing that's happening. I don't have a strong opinion about it, but it's interesting. Yeah. It also feels to be, uh, you know, people without homes and it's getting worse because of the pandemic. It just feels oh, like it's Oh my really God. Yeah, uh, control and, and like no one, you know, I, I kind of feel like there's answers, but no one wants to pull a trigger to help solve the problem. Like, you know, federal money to, you know, put people in hotel rooms that isn't, that they're asked for the money. So it's like, what, who's, who's stopping that, this from happening? You know, who's not helping solve the problem? That's really disturbing. I, and you just see it. I mean, yeah. we don't, I don't go out very much because of, you know, pandemic stuff, but, you know, I do a lot of walking, a lot of driving, you know, around. It's just, it's, it's very different here, you know, this past year, it feels like. And, yeah. I'm not sure who's That's serving true. these people, you know? <laughs> it, was, it was already happening. It's just, just another, it's yeah. a change that was happening. It's been vastly accelerated, I think, by the pandemic. Yeah. With like, and I know there's supposedly is like a, a moratorium on, um, you know, people get, getting kicked out. But I don't, I think in reality, a lot of people have lost their homes and there's a lot yeah. of hunger. Like, you know, in the Santa Monica Airport, which is where I live, they've been doing, um, you know, they're, they're giving out food and the lines are, I mean, it's, it's, startling and that's so i think you're right it's been a big change in the physical sense of the city in the last well, i i feel like it's it's this future dystopia that we're living through you know mm -hmm. in so many ways with you know these the violence the protest you know the 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 police response to the protests in la the the homelessness the the you know linnell george um her story uh, is uh, set in Echo Park, but it's a it's a woman, young woman who's trying to make her way to Venice Beach, to the beach where she uh, grew up. And the beaches are all sealed off for the wealthy. And the canyons are sealed off too for the wealthy. And when you go to the beach, you know, there are many private beaches up in Malibu where 
they're supposed to be public access, but there isn't uh, mm -hmm. because there's like these fake, uh, you know, there's private security and there's um, fencing and walls and everything. So I think that LA is kind of a, is a, uh, a harbinger of what the rest of the country is going to be going through, unfortunately. It's like all the crazy, bad, weird stuff is already here. Um, yeah. And so, you know, when I read her story and when I read Luis's story, Luis was I'm thinking, okay, well, this, if all we need is a couple more really bad years or a couple turns the wrong mm -hmm. way, and we're going to be there. The, the future dystopia that they're writing about is going to, is going to, is going to be where we live already. And yeah. I also think, I mean, I haven't really been out much this past year. I think that when everybody goes out, starts going out, it's going to be crazy. I think there's just going to be, it's going to be like, you know, Blade Runner in the streets with just people, <laughs> people just, you know, out crowding and going to bars and, and people wearing masks too, maybe still. Um, I just and, feel um, bad about all my friends that are musicians, you know, um, I'm sure we all know, yeah. we all know plenty of them. Uh, and I'm just craving live music, for God's sake. I'd love to go out and see a band play, you know? Yeah. Um, something primal that, you know, speaks to all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's going to come back in a big way because... Oh, I think so, too. I think it's, so too. And I think we're going to see just craziness, Yeah. you know, for, for good and bad. And yeah, then, you know, people, more people are going to be out in the streets and it's going to be pandemonium. And look, look at me, I'm clearly the editor of Speculative LA because I'm envisioning <laughs> all this insanity that's coming down the pike. But I mean, I really do feel like there's all this pent up energy and uh, people wanting to go out and hear live music and get drunk on the streets and dance and, mm -hmm. you know, go crazy. And it's, it's going to be a different LA that they're going out to like you said Dwayne you drive around and, and you see it I've never seen so many tents um, yeah and yeah and people are just in, in need of help I mean and I mean I, I do also have the, the mental toll on all of us this has not been a normal year so many stressors that it, it, it feels like it really does, does feel like it's a you know some kind of weird science fiction world <laughs> we kind of yeah. you know hit, hit the gas and here we are in a month we'll say whoa where, what is this you know I, 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 I drove to um Hollywood Forever Cemetery last May or June, just to get, get out of the house, you know, the apartment for a while, walk around and see dead people. Um, and, but driving through Hollywood is like right after some of the, the protests, you know, it was like, yeah. it was like, the it was like a set of a movie. I thought, what is uh, Terry Gilliam here filming 12 Monkeys 2? Like what, what's, it's so weird, you know, that a matter of months, you know, became just so different looking. Um, and you walk yeah. past Valentino's grave and you say, boy, this, this all adds up, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I like how Dwayne to get out of the house went to the cemetery to walk around. It feels like a real sort of a glimpse into Dwayne's psyche there. Like since it's sadly I true. In. Yeah. <laughs> Again, you see me, Ben. You see me. I just I'm a little well, disturbed by that. That's why I tapped you to to write a story, Dwayne, because I knew there was also something very like Blade Runner 2049 about it. Uh, yeah. oh, I don't yeah. want to give away too much, but um there yeah. there was Anytime a character. You mix the robots and detectives. You're in, you know, you're in Blade Runner territory, I think. So in terms of Dwayne's work, you know, anytime you get yeah. police interrogation, that's also a science fiction weirdness thing going on. You have to totally. Tip your hat. You have to tip yeah. Your hat. It's funny. I was yep. talking with uh, Walter Mosley, um, I don't know, a month or so ago. Oh, I humble think. brag. Well, no, doing, doing one of these pro Yeah. So anyway, he was doing it. one of these programs, and uh, he brought his, you know, Easy Rollins character back, and we were talking about Easy Rollins and. Um, and of course, about LA. And, uh, you know, it's great that, that I'm thinking more of the crime writing community, but I appreciate it, Denise, that you, uh, you dedicated the book to Octavia Butler. And we were talking about Butler, Samuel Delaney, uh, you know, Ted Sturgeon, um, Philip K. Dick, and all these people. Um, and at least in the crime fiction world, it's elite, it's good to see, uh, more voices allowed into the into the damn tent you know mm -hmm. um and there's a lot of you know uh shit um mostly was so groundbreaking in that he showed us the la that we hadn't seen before yeah right and although chester yeah. himes was also writing about that in the for late 40s oh yeah no i love yeah. himes too was he writing about la though no nah, he's all he hard. has a novel set in la does he does he 
Oh, that's right. Yeah, what's, it's the one. Yeah, the one of the early. Yes, that's right. There is one set here. The 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 the, the, um, the famous the series though was all Harlan, right? The Harlan's like the Harlan. Harlan. Yeah, so, Just Runs yes. is my favorite title of a crime novel ever, which is Blind Man with a Pistol. I like yeah. every time I see that, I just laugh. It's such a beautiful title. I like I Run and books. Run. I think that's <laughs> oh god. Yeah, and he, he does your Mosley in a lot of ways, just in terms of the style, but also what Mosley does so beautifully is like the so much of the conflict comes from the character's psyche around the specific issues of what it's like to be a black person in LA at that time. Right. So it's like, he's like the point of view is very specific to the African-American experience, especially like Rollins comes from, he comes from Houston, right? Like he's, he, he fights right. in the war and then he ends up in LA and like all of that, that experience, like you said, Patrick, it's like, no one else is going to write that. And that's exactly why you want diversity. It isn't, it isn't in the name of diversity. It's because like, all these people having experiences that are good for crime fiction. Like that makes a good protagonist, you know? Well, and yeah. I think you can say the same thing about speculative fiction, which yeah. for a very long time was an even more white, more male uh, genre than, than crime fiction. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Octavia Butler. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't, it wasn't that they weren't writing. It was that I think publishing uh, was not allowing those voices to be heard. And what's really great now is that there's tons of speculative fiction mm -hmm. um, from new voices. And Akashic is actually publishing uh, a lot of the, those books. Um, they, if you look at their catalog, they've just, they've got um, what, one by Cortia Newland uh, called A River in Time. And Rivers... Rivers Solomon uh, has a second book out. That's not an Akashic book, but the, her first one, uh, their first one was. And so for, uh, and then like N.K. Jemison, have you read N.K. Oh, yeah. Jemison? Oh, I just read the fifth that, grade recently, which I had never read. It's amazing. That Broken yeah. Earth, Shattered Earth trilogy, that is just amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I don't know how to pronounce his first name, Shixin Lu. Oh yeah, yeah. Three oh, Body my. Problem. Love, yes, yeah. yes, Love that stuff yeah. is, and you know that's all said in China. Well, it starts there at least. Yeah. Uh, most of it. My is, wife is, is obsessed said. with those books. They're great. <laughs> my kid, my my two older kids have read that. I haven't read it yet, but they're both like it's astonishing. It's so great. And they're doing it for HBO. Yeah. Well, the yeah. Own guys are doing it. Uh, they're doing the three body problem for HBO. Oh really? Oh, that's yeah. cool. Oh, right. Well, I mean that's the last I heard. You know how development goes, but supposedly yeah. that's they're doing. <laughs> It's going to be hard because there's so much. But I guess what I'm saying is, Game of Thrones, so they figured it out. Yeah, right. that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, but you know what I'm saying is, it's so refreshing to read those those novels from those perspectives and and those cultural and racial perspectives, because um, you we needed them so much, you know. Yeah. And so it's it's great, and and I know there has been uh, some pushback, and there's been a lot of ugliness, but I, I just think that um, it's super important. And there's a really good book of short stories if you just want to kind of like dip in and out called uh, "A People's Future of the United States." Is and, that John Joseph Adams who did that one? Is that yeah, <laughs> him and somebody else. I, I have the book over there. I forget who uh, right now, but uh, yeah, that those are those are incredible. Uh, authors i think there's 25 stories and um and that, will... that book after they buy this book <laughs> absolutely you mean this book then <laughs> this book right here <laughs> and they should then, buy the then poison go, pen and then go buy this book. Oh, and that one also put that on your list too that isn't out yet but you should put it on your list uh anyway but uh, you know it, <laughs> it's like you you talk about you talk Shameless. we talk about our book and our stories and I think it's good to to put it also in perspective that we're not writing in a vacuum that I also think there's a huge interest in speculative fiction today um, and you know the the party's just getting bigger and I think people perhaps after a year of pandemic are really hungry for escape escapist fiction. Um, I know I am uh, and I don't mean to escape like you know to the Middle Ages or something. I just mean gosh, I, sometimes I wish that this were not my reality. Not so much since January, but, uh, you know, the, the last four years were really tough. And you just think, this is a, I'm living in a dystopic novel, and I don't want to be here. And what about the alternate timelines? You know, William Gibson does that so well. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, with the peripheral and, and, and those. But I do think I there's a lot. I, I know that we're, we're speaking at an event at a uh, mystery bookstore, Poison Pen, but I do think there's a lot of crossover between uh, crime fiction and I was gonna ask oh, yeah. speculative fiction. 
Yeah. There's Cujo. It's Cujo. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's right. to me. That's, that's kind of interesting that the word speculative kind of does cover a lot. It covers, you know, science fiction, fantasy, horror, even to me, like you know, crime and mystery is sort of that. Uh, this is a spectrum there, right? And it all bleeds together. And I think readers and audiences today are more, much more open to it. Where you know, 20 years ago, it still felt like very, very much categories. What kind of book is that? I remember my first novel. I was trying to sell it, and the other reaction was, "This is cool, but where do we sell it? Because it's so many things at once." And it's kind of like now I feel like that's more embraced. It feels like and readers are willing to go with you to, yeah. you know, different fiction. worlds. It's all speculative. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Like speculation. What if a guy followed a whale around? Cause he was obsessed with the whale. Like, that was a <laughs> right? And like, but what if an asteroid was going to hit the earth and, uh, yeah, and a guy's still trying to solve mysteries. What a great idea. <laughs> uh, but like, the national book award, I was just, just won by Charlie Yu for his book, interior Chinatown, which is, yeah. Like, Totally, it's it's a weird awesome. blend of a of a, a true Hollywood story and like a, an imaginative parable thing. It's like it's totally in the realm of fantasy science fiction, although it's also very literary. Like I think the world is just like I think the literary world is very open, just like the a sort of sloshing around of category in a way that is I think pretty healthy. And certainly for yeah. me and for both of you guys, you know Denise and Dwayne, as people who write somewhat on the borderline between categories. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. I think like I like the idea that my books, like The Quiet Boy, for example, which comes out May 18th, like, <laughs> that it's both a, it's a mystery novel, but it's also a kind of weird science fiction novel. And like it doesn't matter. You don't have to be like it's one or the other. It's just is what it is. You know, the right? boundaries are definitely blurring, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, the definition to me is like how do you define speculative or any of these categories like imaginative? Like you put a lot of cool imagination and world building, or even in our world, it's still like world building of what this thing is. What is this system you're looking at? What is this neighborhood? That to me is like what I'm drawn to. If I you know, hear reviews that say this writer is, you know, brings out uh, new ideas and like very, a lot of that imagination, I'm like, I'll try it. I'll go there. What I don't want totally. is safe by the numbers, you know, what often they call literary fiction to me is often means like, oh, it's very safe. It's very much like, you know, suburban guy has a breakdown and i don't know it just feels very much like you know to me i i almost like had I, I this reaction to the literary fiction is like oh no thank you i want i want monsters and zombies and clowns that's what i want you know? do you right. notice totally but like <laughs> literary fiction can be good if it oh yeah of course but journey but i think a lot of times literary fiction gives people an excuse to be quite timid in the reach of where the story can go it's like well it's just it's a suburban story so it has to stay here like but yeah I have yeah. a lot of opinions about this also. I no, generally agree with you. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I also get really bored with people writing a kind of narrow thing from their own specific experience. Like, it's just like the world is so big and there's just yeah. so much. And like, don't feel, and I, this is to the extent that anyone ever asked me what to do as a writer, it's like, fucking just go. Just don't yeah. feel, feel any kind of borderline of what you can or can't do. And I think, it, it, yeah, there's like, don't, just don't be afraid. Just fucking do whatever. I don't know. Have a ball. Yeah. Like, have, be <laughs> well, and I think that all of the, a lot of the literary giants are writing yeah. speculative fiction now, but whether they call it that or not. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. You know, um, it's your wish a girl. Jonathan like Franzen and, you know, yeah. the other Jonathan. Oh, and, and, yeah. And like, leave them. I mean, Mitchell. some of the stuff we think of as being like the superstar authors, they're doing stuff that is just like, yeah. Go wherever they Who's the Marlon James novel about the leopard a couple years ago? Yeah, yeah. It's great. You know, yeah, giant fantasy epic. It's it's, it's so cool, you know. What's funny is uh, you mentioned Jonathan uh, uh, Latham. I was reading him when he had this really dorky, dorky sci-fi novels in the late 90s. I loved his stuff. It was like, oh, man. And he kind of went, went more, he went more legit. I'm like, oh, man, he's not weird and freaky like me anymore. You know, I mean, he's always wonderful. But it's just kind of funny watching that. And then back again, he's like now. It's back. Yeah, that's the kind of guy, the kind of writer, and there are a bunch of, of writers like like this, who I'm just like, I'll just go where he or she goes. Like, yeah, I will, and yeah. like I feel this way. For example, about like certain musicians, like Elvis Costello, he's gonna he's just been doing something different every album for the last forty years. But it's like I know I like that. I know I like Lethem. I'm gonna read what he writes. Like Patricia Highsmith yeah. wrote, she wrote the Ripley novels, which are very specific, and then she wrote, you know, Price of Salt. You know, like she wrote, but right. where she goes, I'm gonna go there because like I just I. Terrible person, by the way, but like I love that, <laughs> yeah. you know. And like, and Octavia Butler, I think people say the same thing. Like, there's just like she goes where she went, where she wanted to go, and like, yeah, that's what you want, right? You want an author, no matter what they do. And actually, yeah. Kazuo Ishiguro, who I just mentioned, I haven't read the new one yet, but like, Remains of the Day is so different from, um, oh yeah, 
what's the one they made the great movie the um never let me go, let me go are, yeah you can't believe those were by the same person except you can because the intelligence is so high and like the storytelling is so high yeah let me before before we kind of uh, before I grill Denise about her work in progress, um, <laughs> uh, I'm not saying much. I'm. Oh man, I do have some questions. Patrick has that, ways of making you talk. Yes, uh, I have some questions from our Facebook audience. So let me just see what we got oh, cool. here. Uh, Is Zuckerberg on there? Let's see. <laughs> um, well, Les Klinger, who's uh, let's see, oh. our, our buddy. Hi, Les. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe I'm wrong. Um, lots of people just kind of chiming in. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, here's a good one. Yeah, Les's question, um, uh, for anybody who's put together an, an anthology, they will relate to this, which is, uh, were, there, were there writers that you wanted that, who were the ones that got away? Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest one who got away was, uh, oh my God. I'm, blanking on his name okay who was the co-screenwriter for both the Blade Runners oh Hampton Fancher Hampton Fancher was going to write a story for speculative wow. LA wow. and I wooed him and wooed him and called him and wrote him and he would send me little snippets of things and I'd say yes keep going you know he's like 82 or something and by the way have you seen that documentary about him it is crazy oh. you got to see this documentary about him He's had like 10 lives. He grew up in East LA in Boyle Heights, I think. And he wow. ran away to join the Merchant Marine when he was 14. And he, um, he was a gigolo. And then he was an actor. <laughs> and he was, he was like an actor for like 10 years. He was married to Sue Lyons, huh. Lolita. Oh, OK. And then, and then he, he, you know, he wasn't, he, he did a ton of Westerns. And um, he was always kind of the heavy, the bad guy. And he wrote, you know, the ones where they, they were on horses all the time and shooting. And then I guess that was kind of drying up. So he um, was trying to find something else to do. And he convinced um, uh, Philip K. Dick to uh, sell him the option to uh, do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I really wanted him to write a short story, but he was on heavy, heavy deadline for some, I think, Blade Runner related stuff uh, for Hollywood. Mm. And he never, and also he's in his 80s and he lives in Brooklyn, but he is sharp as a tack. And uh, it just never worked out with it. I guess he's the one who never turned in any. And finally, I just had to, I kept giving him deadlines. Actually, yeah, that's true. There was the one who never made the deadline. <laughs> and he kept saying that he was, you know, they were kind of going to come break his kneecaps because he was so late in turning in this. Uh, Blade Runner stuff and he kept saying to me I've been paid I have to write this and it's like come on how hard can it be just bang me out a story and yeah. he, so he's the one he's the total one who got away because that would have been great to have Mr. Blade Runner screenwriter yeah what yeah awesome. it's funny um there aren't really that many questions just people chiming in but uh David who's who watches a lot of the programs say hey, David he says uh Colson Whitehead is literary fiction but man, he's got zombies and alternative history and all kinds of imaginative greatness. Yeah. Underground Railroad, absolutely. absolutely. I yeah. love that book. Yeah, it's great. All right, Denise, Denise tell us about the book. Well, uh, <laughs> I, all I'm gonna say at this point is that it takes place in the same world that my short story takes place. Oh, <laughs> nice, there you go. Awesome. Wonderful. It's, is it it's a standalone or is it part of something? Does it sort of connect no. to the story? No. It, uh, it's just, it, it's, it's taking the idea of the story and uh, kind of expanding it. It's, it's set in a, right. in a strange world where uh, somebody goes looking for their boyfriend and kind of stumbles into this whole kind of alternate world in LA that it's kind of unclear wow. whether it's what's going on. So that's, that's all I'm gonna awesome. say for now. But. As long as we add more bars to more trails in LA, I'll be happy. Just yeah. get that thing going. Get that idea out there in the world. Let's get more I, bars. I want to go to trails. that bar. I totally want to go yeah, to that bar. <laughs> I had to create it in fiction so I could go there. <laughs> What's that one though? It's not not in LA proper. It's like kind of toward Malibu or maybe Thousand Oaks. It's called the Old Bar or something. It's just the ancient. Old, the Old Place. The Old yeah, Place. The old Was that an inspiration for your story at all, or not really something different? I, hadn't, I had not been there. I had only heard of it uh, when I started imagining mine, but. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was, um, and then I went, I, I went there and it, it wasn't old enough. It was not old enough. It needed to oh. be older and weirder, but that's a great place. That, that's a great place. If you go to LA, Patrick, next time you're in LA, you got to go to the old place. There's also, there's, you know, there's a stables at the top of the Hollywood Hills um, where you can rent, I think they do a lot of filming there uh, for Hollywood, but you can okay. rent horses on a, on, in the summer on a full moon and you can ride all the way over the ridge and down into Burbank. And then you uh, hitch oh. up your, your horse and you have margaritas at this little place near the um, equestrian center in Burbank. And then uh -oh. um, after, and then after you've had, you know, margaritas and, and some good Mexican food, then the, you get back into the horse and basically the horses, you don't even have to like try to, <laughs> you know, do anything with the horse. The horse hasn't been fed and he wants to go back and have his dinner. So they just go up over the trail and back down into the stables. It's at the top of Beechwood Canyon. And boy, wow. when, when, when I did that, it was a long time ago, but it was so eerie, and I did feel like I could be in a whole other place, a whole other time. You, yeah, know, you said it was a full moon. You said stables. I heard Staples, the office supply shop. Oh. Like, you know, staples on top of the they rent horses at Staples. Like that's, <laughs> that's incredible. No, no, the, that's, <laughs> staples makes more sense. Staples. Makes more sense. <laughs> but, I mean, you find it. You that find sounds it hard awesome. to believe that there's actually still horses up there in the Hollywood Hills. Oh yeah, there's a yeah. whole there's, in Burbank's a whole rancho of district, right? There's a whole a lot of yeah. stables, not stables, stables. Um, I we go, you know, go walking behind the pavilions. It's a whole like little horse village. Yeah. Or something. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Will Rogers, the Will Rogers trails. There's uh, up north of Bramwood, There's horses up there too. It's crazy. That's wow. right. I've gone running up there and seen them. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful up there. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy wow. my talking. <laughs> Guys, what's that? What's that movie? I was just trying to think about it, and it's it's very apropos of what we're talking about with Edward Norton, who uh, it's the frontier. Okay, it's that delusion that he's. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, he goes to L.A. Um, and he hallucinates the frontier. Uh, oh shit! Jeez, no, no, I want to see it. This sounds good. See it <laughs> it's pretty interesting film. <laughs> You better you better post something on Facebook. I, post you, I can't remember what it's called. You, uh, maybe somebody on Facebook will remember, but uh, ah, it's worth seeing. But I mean, it's one of those Mandela effect things, Mandela effect, where only Patrick has seen this movie, and the rest of us in the reality have not seen it. Doesn't exist, but only Patrick has seen this Edward Norton seen, movie. I don't see very many movies either, too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but well, we digress. But um, what time is it? I guess we're running. I'm too, too. Does anybody have a uh, an LA no novel that they really love that they think is underappreciated that they oh, like yeah. to throw into the mix? Can anybody think of one? I mean, there's there's plenty of them, but uh, yeah. Um, geez, there's some. I mean, my mind's going through my bookshelf behind me, literally. Like, that sheet went in my bookshelf. I have like my LA collection. Um, yeah, I'm always bad at this. I always dry up when I'm put on the spot. About yeah. I can't think of yeah. Well, I'll just say Octavia Butler's um, Parable of the Sower. I yeah. mean, that's kind of, and people know about that more now. Yeah. Uh, that takes place in Altadena, in Pasadena. That's where it starts. And uh, the society's falling apart. And it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really uh, gripping book. book. And there's yeah. also a, a kind of a dictator who, whose slogan is make America great. Yeah, uh -huh. she got, there was a bunch of press around that. I remember during the election, everyone was like, holy shit, Octavia Butler called this one. Cause yeah, he's gonna yeah. make America great again. He's, he's a sort of self-obsessed pinhead. Uh, yeah. Uh, would be yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I will just say that, you know, Linnell George, uh, who is, uh, has a story in uh, a speculative Los Angeles. She's just done a book of Octavia Butler's writing. Uh, oh. So she's been very deep into into Octavia Butler's stories and uh, fiction and, and in, in her head. And um, the, the book is great. And I don't, I don't know if it's uh, inspired her directly or, or, or what, but uh, there's, a, there's a great example of uh, Octavia Butler, someone who um, was known at the time because she won a MacArthur and she, um, you know, Harlan Ellison championed her, but somehow she fell off the radar, and I think it's because she was a black woman. You know, oh, undeniably so. Undeniably, yeah. so. she never had. Now she's sort of having a mainstream success that I don't think she had in her lifetime. If I, if and I, she uh, worked. I mean, she had like this clerical uh, job. You know, yeah. but she also had no husband to support her and no wife to cook for her. 
So, right. Yeah. I dug the Lisa the Lisa Morton story. I was trying to think who wrote the Los Feliz story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Too. That was terrific. I thought of an LA book. I thought of an LA book. You should read um, IQ by Joe Ede. Um, oh, my, yeah. my, uh, <laughs> my pal Joe Ede. He, uh, he's yeah. great. And there, I think there are three or he's written he's written like three or four of those books. Of this. I'm, I'm shaking my head because he wrote the first one came out when I had a book out. And but since then, he's written like nine times more books than I have. He's crazy. <laughs> but uh, those books are great. And they're set in LA. They're great, great private eye books. Uh, yeah, recently, Katie, I recently read um, uh, Newton Thornburg's To Live and Die in California from uh, 73. And it's set in Santa Barbara mostly, but to me, it's like the old Southern California guy, a uh, guy from out in the Midwest. Um, his son died mysteriously, he comes out to figure out what happened. It's a great, it's sad, but a, a really powerful story. Um, that to me, it was like, yeah, just What's incredible. Uh, to Live and Die in California. You wrote Cutter, oh. and, Cutter and Bone. Cutter and Bone was and his also. Um, quite a few really wonderful books um there's one of those i haven't read yet valhalla's in la actually an la post-apocalyptic story that he wrote i want to say in the early 80s that i've not read yet but i'm eager to check it out that'll be for speculative los angeles the classics that's a great idea by yeah. the way there's a lot of well, cool stuff we did that with expanding to southern california i'm going to say you got to do the kinsey milhome novels because they basically they're basically set in santa barbara yeah the, yeah you know, the alphabet novels those are those are it's a fictionalized santa barbara but those are great absolutely down in the valley is the name of the movie down uh, in the valley. Hey, kinney saved me my buddy is <laughs> <laughs> that's it it's, it's worth seeing um hmm. i'm going to submit and this is it's not that it's it's getting the attention some attention now but uh Dorothy B. Hughes is in a lonely place. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, a remarkable Fantastic. LA novel. Yeah, and it talks about the you know the menace of the canyons between the city and the ocean that existed back then. What a great book! I think she's Margaret Millar's anything by Margaret yeah. Millar too. Oh yeah, and because her yeah. stuff is very yeah. spooky. Yeah, her stuff is I like Margaret Millar a lot. I, I read a bunch of those a couple of years ago. She's great. That stuff's yeah. great. Yeah. Have you guys read, um, speaking of actually, is this on, on topic, LA novel, uh, speculative, uh, Golden Days by Carolyn C. It's this great, wonderful, yeah. um, have you read it, Denise? Yeah. I mean, it's sort of, it, it kind of changes genres halfway through in a kind of crazy way, but I, I just thought I was blown away by it. I, I read it when I first moved here. Someone said, oh, this is a great LA novel. I'm like, well, this is really dark. <laughs> sort of, it, it really did have a, uh, knock me out, but uh, it's really, that's a great one I recommend. Isn't that Lisa C's Mama? Yes. 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 And her memoir. Oh. Her, her memoir, oh, her memoir is fantastic too. Yeah, I read that too. It's wonderful. Dreaming, I think it's called, or something like, like dreaming or something similar. Really good. But, Did you guys read um, "Your House Will Pay" by Steph Cha? Oh, not yet. That's a great recent LA novel. Excellent. She's great. Yeah. I thought yeah. Ivy Pakoda's book, "These Women." Yeah. Like, I haven't read that yet. Everyone oh, keeps telling great. me to. I don't know why I haven't read it yet. There's so many great books. There really are. Now it's a problem. It's a problem. Some, somebody on the Facebook feed said uh, mentioned Richard Lang. Um, oh yeah. Man, we oh, were yeah. talking about him a little bit before we got started. Yeah. yeah I love, love his stuff. But anyway, so, guys, we're nerding so out. Great, this there's yeah. so many great writers. There's just too many. That's the problem. Like with Speculative LA, I could have picked 14 other fabulous authors. You got to do volume two. Yeah. That's is Johnny going to do different cities with this thing? Is that the idea? Things are, uh, you know, we'll see how this one does. You yeah. know, that's, that's the idea. It's up to you, Patrick. I think it's a natural, no you know, I think it's a, it's a great idea and, and all of that. But, you know, one, one step at a time, I guess. But yeah. at, any, at any rate, so if... Congratulations on all the attention it's getting. Well-deserved. I mean, I... As I said, I think it's a really inspired collection and um, really happy that the three, the three of you were able to spend an hour with me tonight talking about it. That was great. Yeah. We're happy that you're so interested and, and you ask great questions too. So love, yeah. you, love your enthusiasm. And I didn't know you were an LA native, so that's awesome. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And so Ben, we'll be, we'll be setting up some sort of virtual thing, I'm sure. Or maybe yes. even person, probably not yet, but uh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? It would be awesome. <laughs> I could come to Arizona in May, that would be the most amazing thing in the world. But uh, and I fear I, we'll be in these stupid boxes still. I guess road trip, uh, road trip, man. Falling asleep <laughs> in the background there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's Caesar, Archie. yeah. Our pandemic uh, puppy. Who, um, <laughs> and Dwayne, how about you? Are any any new books on the horizon, or are you 
doing mostly comic books and TV stuff now. On the horizon, but it, but uh, some some movement. I can't. Say, it's too early to say anything. But I I'm working on you know like two new things. I can't say more. One's crime novel and one's uh, not a crime novel. So we'll <laughs> see how it goes. We'll see who wants them. <laughs> that are wanted out there. I want them. Uh, I want them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I know. I know. We all want more. Yeah. Um, Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Well, hey, thanks so much. And um, everybody have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank nice to see all of you. All right. Thank Good you night, everybody. Thanks, next everybody. time, Lusos. Thanks for watching. Yes. yes. Yeah, next time, Lusos. <laughs> see yeah. you guys. Right. Friends. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.